Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me again. It's good to see you all. I've been coming occasionally for about 10 years now, so long enough to recognize some of you, even though you're wearing masks. But it's great to be back here again with you. Oh, I think um, a lot of people of late, when it comes to socializing, because we have to socialize outdoors, um, have been meeting around fires. Uh, my, me and my friends certainly have been. Like so many evenings, we've just had a fire, met in a garden, and just chatted. And um, one such recent evening, a friend of mine um, introduced the healthy discussion point of what questions, my friend asked, do you think it is hardest for a Christian to answer? And then he made it still more personal. Which questions do you struggle with most? I think that's a really good conversation to have. There are good reasons to doubt the Christian faith. For example, it's not obvious that God is love. We look around the world, we read the news, and it is not obvious that God is love. No, I'm persuaded that he is. But it's not a no-brainer. There are no no-brainers in the Christian faith. There are good reasons to doubt. And we must allow ourselves a freedom to feel the power of those reasons for doubt, both for our own sake, for our own integrity, but also for those who don't yet know the Lord Jesus, that we might speak with them with greater um, persuasion, better thought through answers. And I'm persuaded that there are very good answers to these questions. I don't know them all, and neither do you. And that's all right if we don't know the answers. We see today, Daniel doesn't know the answer to the question that he's asked. But let's be honest in saying there are good questions and big questions that a Christian must ask himself or herself. Now, at the moment, as has been said already, I gather you're going through the book of Daniel um, sequentially, but I had to move dates, so sorry, we've done chapter 1, chapter 3, and now back to chapter 2, but that won't matter for today. And this book of the Bible, Daniel, it brings up huge questions, questions about whether God is real, questions about whether God is powerful, questions about whether God is loving. You see, the setting of this book is a few hundred years before Christ, and it's at a real low point for God's people. Allow me to assume that you weren't all here for uh, the sermon on chapter one. In, in fact, some of you, I don't know, it may be your first time ever in church, welcome. Um, so let me quickly sit, set the scene. Um, chapter one, verse one, we read, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and besieged it. <laughs> Gosh, what wonderful names they had. And you don't particularly need to remember the names. You don't particularly need to have a firm grasp on where the kingdom of Judah is and where the empire of Babylon is. But we just need to understand that the little kingdom of God's people is being attacked by the huge Babylonian empire and God's people fight and they lose. And as part of that fight, there's an awful siege on the capital city of Jerusalem and many of God's people die awfully. It's a terrible time that the Bible details elsewhere. And of the ones that are left, many of the ruling classes are kidnapped, they are deported far away to the land of Babylon in hope that the working classes left behind won't rebel against their new overlords. But then only a few years later they do rebel and so the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, he sends his armies to utterly crush what is left of God's kingdom. Again there is mass slaughter and the temple in Jerusalem, the sign of God's presence with his people, the temple is utterly destroyed. It really looks, at the beginning of the book of Daniel, as if it's game over for God's people. 
Now, might they not have questions at this point? Good questions, right? We read in verse 2 of chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar carried off, he carried off the articles from the temple of God, all the religious stuff from the temple. He carried them off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. The taking of the religious stuff from God's temple was to symbolize that the gods of the Babylonians had conquered the God of Israel. And imagine being the people of Israel in that day. It must have felt that way. This big looking empire, God couldn't defend us. And now, the articles of the temple are in the articles of this other God. Can you join me in imagining how it would have felt to be one of God's people at this time? Can you think of some of the questions that they might have had? If you were one of God's people, you've just seen everyone killed around you, dragged off in chains to a foreign country, what questions would you have? You must have questions at this point as one of God's people. God had said that he would be with them forever. Never will I leave you, he said. Never will I forsake you. But I imagine they were feeling pretty forsaken at this point. After all, it was actually God who brought the Babylonians against them. We read that at the beginning of verse 2 of chapter 1. It says, and the Lord, I think I have that on screen, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. The Lord did it. I mean, it would have felt awful if God was just too weak to protect his people, but actually God handed them over. God himself is against them in this exile to Babylon. He has caused this to happen. And if God is against them, who can be for them? Does God still love them? Are they still God's people? Or are they rejected now? These are not no-brainer questions. These are the kind of questions I think if we were in their shoes, we should be asking. These are the kind of questions that I ask when life doesn't go the way I'm expecting it to. These questions matter. And I want you to keep these questions in your mind as we go on because I think we are they are so important for how we understand this book and it's not just how we understand this book it's how we are to live out joyful and full Christian lives so for example I expect that when you looked at Daniel chapter 1 and when you looked at Daniel chapter 3 one of the main pieces of application that you considered was how how did how people in Daniel's day and how people in our day, us, how can we live distinctly as God's people living in a non-Christian culture? I'll say that again because I kind of stumbled. People in God's day, <laughs> people in Daniel's day and people in our day, how can we live distinctly as God's people in a non-Christian culture? I expect that was some of the application for chapter 1 and chapter 3, and that's right, absolutely right. We, too, like Daniel, we must consider what do we eat, what do we drink, what do we do, think back to chapter 3, what do we do if the government for, try to force us to compromise religiously, like when he tried to get Daniel's friends to bow down to an idol, like Daniel, we live in a culture which norms and values are not Christian. And those of us here this morning who follow the Lord Jesus, we are called to live differently to those around us. As Daniel was called to live differently to the Babylonians around him, so we are called to live differently to our countrymen. Living for Jesus, speaking for Jesus in all things honouring him, even when that is countercultural. And I'd love to expand on that, on this theme of living distinctly, 
uh, in a non-Christian culture, but you've already seen that in chapters 1 and 3, and you'll see it again in chapter 6. It is one of the big themes of Daniel. But there's another theme developed in this book that begins to be developed in this chapter, chapter 2, and it concerns the greatness of God, which is going to be important. You see, it's all very well and good to know what I, that I ought to be living differently to those around me, but why should I? Is it worth it? Daniel, it seems he does know how he should live differently to his Babylonian neighbours, and I know how to live differently to my neighbours in Leicester. It's not, no, it's not knowledge that I lack when I'm tempted to not live God's way, but sometimes I lack motivation. Why shouldn't Daniel just live like everyone else around him? Now, it's no good just preaching moralism to a Christian. Moralism doesn't bring the heart change that, that leads to the transformation that God wants to see. Moralism won't keep me honouring God with my heart when it would be just easier to ignore God and go my own way. For Daniel, ignoring God would have made life a lot easier in some ways. He doesn't get thrown into the lion's den. This is a bit of a spoiler of what's coming. He doesn't get thrown into a lion's den for just behaving like everyone else. So why does he keep on choosing godliness? What's his motivation? Why should we keep on choosing godliness? I've suggested that Daniel, living in exile, might feel abandoned by God, unloved by him. And when I feel anything of that in my life, my motivation to live for Jesus wanes. Is God's kingdom worth holding out for, even when it's hard? We're going to see from Daniel chapter 2 that God's kingdom is worth holding out for. We're going to see from Daniel chapter 2 that God has not abandoned his people, that he still loves his people, he is still mighty for his people, he still reigns, that he rules, that his plan is to bring all things under King Jesus. And that this is a plan worth dying for, and it's even worth living for. So, remember the story that we just heard read so well? as a wonderful uh, Nebuchadnezzar, thank you. Remember, it all started with Nebuchadnezzar having this troubling dream and summoning, summoning all the wise people of the kingdom to interpret it. And they say, no problem. You tell us a dream and we will interpret it. But the king says, you tell me my dream and then interpret it. Fail to do this, and I will cut you into pieces. And at this point, the advisors are in trouble because the king is asking them to do something that is impossible. But their response makes me laugh. Okay, so the king has demanded that they tell him his dream. But verse 7, once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. <laughs> it's just like, what do you do with this impossible command that's given? It's like, uh, okay. But the king's not having it. The king's not having it. He's determined that, he, that they must do this impossible thing. Oh dear. And they say, look, this isn't fair. But the king just gets angry and cries off with their heads. And Daniel is one of these wise men. I don't know whether he was there before the king at this point, but he's one of the wise men of the kingdom. So he's in trouble, along with his friends who are also in such a position. They're also advisors to the king. They are going to be cut to pieces. And there's nothing that they can do about it. They have no power 
to overturn this decree. Daniel cannot deal with this situation. And I could feel for him here, because we're often in that situation. We're often in situations that we can't deal with. Some situations where we're not big enough to bring change. I, as a person, I, I'm a person who likes to think that he can cope. You know, mustn't grumble, just get on with things. Well, that English bluster isn't going to cut it for Daniel here. They cannot cope. They are at the end of their earthly resources. They are going to die, and there's nothing that they can do about it. Except go to one who is more powerful even than King Nebuchadnezzar. They turn in prayer to the God of heaven. And they pray through the night. And verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, praise Daniel, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to me the dream of the king. The dream of the king was beyond what Daniel could possibly know. As the Babylonian wise men said in verse 10, no one on earth could do what the king was asking. Verse 11, no one could reveal it to the king except the gods. And they, said the wise men, do not live among humans. Now, of course, these these astrologers and whatnot, they could have asked their gods for the answer, and maybe they did, but the problem with them asking their gods, and this is really a fundamental problem, is that they don't exist, and so they can't give the answer. But Daniel's God, the God revealed by Jesus when he did indeed come and live among humans, he does exist. He draws near to us in prayer. Prayer, prayer is not powerful, but when we pray to the powerful God of Daniel, God sometimes deigns to answer our prayers in wonderful ways. You see, the articles of the temple, well, they may well have been captured and put in the temple of Nebuchadnezzar's God, but God was never conquered. Even when this same God was nailed to a tree, he was not conquered. If Daniel was ever tempted to believe, being where he was, being in exile, if Daniel was ever tempted to believe that God was not powerful, or if we are ever tempted to think that God is not powerful, we must look to what only he can do and think again. God is not only shown to be powerful here, he is shown to be wise. In Daniel's day, all the astrologers and the others and the false gods, they looked wise, but ultimately, when it came to it, they had no answers. If Daniel was ever tempted to go along with the received wisdom of his age, or we, if we are ever tempted to think that we know better than God. If we're ever tempted to think that we know better than God, perhaps we need to be humbled and to remember the lesson that Daniel here gives to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. 
Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And I love Daniel's answer here, his humble answer here. The king says, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no. <laughs> this is verse 7. Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you are laying in bed are these. And I won't read the rest of it as it's been shown so well and read so well. But Daniel then outlines to the king this dream of this giant statue made of four metals, as we saw. And these four metals represented four different empires. The first empire was the empire currently reigning in that part of the world. It was Nebuchadnezzar's empire of Babylon. But the rest of the dream is prophetic. It is a glimpse of the future that God alone is able to reveal. Because God alone, God alone is Lord over history. God revealed to the king something of what these future kingdoms will be like. And there are incredible details in these prophecies. These prophecies are going to be elaborated on in later chapters when you get to those. Um, and we'll learn great, in great detail what these kingdoms will be like. We learn about political alliances. We learn about marriages. We learn about military tactics that then later, hundreds of years later, we see happen in history. It's quite marvellous. The prophecies of the book of Daniel contain the kind of detail that no fortune teller would dare to put that kind of detail into um, their charlatan prophecies. They closely detail the rise and fall, first of the Babylonian Empire of Daniel's day, but after that, the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire. They are clear prophecies that God alone was able to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar and explain to him. And God does so through his servant, Daniel. He does so in order to demonstrate to the king that there is a king above him who alone knows the future. Because there is a king above Nebuchadnezzar who alone is sovereign over the future. God does not leave history to chance. It might be cheesy to say so, but it's history because it's his story. God knew what was to come because he was to bring about what was to come. God is God. And the story ends in verse 46 with Nebuchadnezzar on his face before a man who is essentially his slave. It's quite a reversal. The king has come to see that there is a king above him, a king who knows, because he is a king who ordains. Now, how about you? I don't really know any of you. Maybe this is your first time ever in church. Or perhaps you've been coming for a long time, but you don't really know where you stand with the King, the God of heaven. Is there any reason why it shouldn't be today that you come before God in humility and you confess that he is God and you are not? Are you ready to kneel before the King of heaven? God stepped in and humbled Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see him humble him again in chapter 
a later chapter. Chapter 4, I think. I asked earlier, why should Daniel live God's way? If God has abandoned him to live in exile, why should Daniel live God's way? I asked earlier, why should we live God's way when sometimes God's ways do not make sense to us? And they don't, do they? Sometimes God's ways do not make sense to us. But God never did abandon Daniel. And God's plans don't need to make sense to us. God was with Daniel in Babylon and he is with us here. God has a plan. That doesn't make the plan easy. There was real suffering in Daniel's day. There may be real suffering in our lives. But God has a plan. Maybe Daniel could make sense of this plan. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe God's plans for your life make sense to you. Maybe they don't. But as verse 22 says, God knows what lies in darkness. And light dwells with him. Not with you. Not with me. God is a God who knows. He knows you. He knows your fears. He knows your disappointments. He knows what's confusing in your life. He knows how your plans have had to change. He knows your joys. He knows your hopes. He knows what you're thankful for. And God knows what he's doing. He is a God who is intimately involved, not just in world history as we see through the kingdoms that came, but he is intimately involved in our lives as well. His plans for history will not be thwarted. His plans for you are good. Walk in them with thanksgiving and trust. He knows what he is doing. And everything's going to be okay. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a statue, we saw these four kingdoms, and then we saw that he dreamt that a rock would come, verse 44, crushing these former kingdoms. But he'd learned that this new kingdom would never be destroyed, but will endure forever. Brothers and sisters, we live in the era of this new kingdom. Hundreds of years after Daniel was living, God himself did come to live amongst humans. And he ushered in a new kingdom where Jesus reigns as king. The Babylonian kingdom is no more. The Roman Empire is no more. The British Empire is no more. Earthly kingdoms will come and go. But Jesus is the king of this kingdom which has arrived in part and will go on. He will go on reigning forever and ever. He is your king. And he is a good king. Trust him. During good times, we can trust him. During hard times, we can trust him. During confusing times, we can trust him. He's not like Nebuchadnezzar. He's no petty earthly king asking us to do what is impossible and cutting us to pieces if we fail to do what he can, we cannot do. Now, he's the God of heaven who came to earth in order for he himself to do what was impossible for us to do so that we can be friends with him. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and rises up, raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness 
and light dwells with him. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we live as people of your kingdom. Thank you that you are our king, that you came, that you said the kingdom of God is near. Our Lord Jesus, we look forward to when you usher in your kingdom in all its fullness, when there is no more death, there's no more COVID, there's no more mourning, crying, pain, there's no more self-isolation, there are no more masks, there are no more keys. Why would we need keys? We thank you that your kingdom is a wonderful kingdom. Thank you that you are a wonderful king, a wonderful God, a wonderful brother. Thank you that you have done what was impossible for us to do. That you came and you lived this perfect life. That you, even Daniel was a sinner. But you, you are the good man who lived perfectly before his heavenly father, thank you that because of you, we can be called his sons along with you. And so we pray in your name with great thankfulness and we we ask that by your spirit you would help us to live this week distinctly as Christians as your kingdom people within the United Kingdom. Please help us to live such good lives amongst our neighbours that they look at us and know that we are living for a different king. So we pray these things for your glory. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew suggested uh, we sing Crown...